statistically speaking, we have seen that interfaith marriages are, there's a lot of numbers that make it a little bit more difficult for them to stay together, raising family, kids, building a life together, parents, you know, as we're talking about parents being involved, there's a lot more complications. A lot of times people say no to a lot of things from a place of fear. And I just want to encourage people that like, if you're looking for love, doing it from a place of love and finding reasons to say yes. Yes to going an event. Yes to talking to a matchmaker. Yes to having someone help you with your dating profile. Just like yes to things. When someone comes to me who has a really strong connection to their Judaism, whether that means that they, for example, had grandparents who are Holocaust survivors or perhaps they're Israeli and so they're really strongly uh, linked to the state of Israel and to Zionism. Whatever that super strong link is, it makes them more likely to find it important to date Jewish. Hello, welcome to the Asian Dating Podcast. I'm your host, May Bugenhagen. I am the founder of Two Asian Matchmakers, and my company started out of Los Angeles, and I am physically near Colorado Springs, and I help men of all ethnicities who want to date Asian women. And of course, dating is such a universal topic. I can't just have all Asian guests. Today, I have three lovely Jewish matchmakers joining us, and they are called the Yentas, as they playfully call themselves. Dating coach and matchmaker trainer, Eliza Ben Shalom of Marriage Minded Mentor, Modern Matchmaker, Michal Neistetter with Michal Matches, and matchmaker Danielle, is it Selber? Yep. Selber, with the nonprofit Tribe 12, has disrupted Jewish Philadelphia's single scene. Instead of competing, they collaborate which I love when matchmakers collaborate and help each other. They meet monthly to support each other's work in the community. And now with their own podcast, with the release of the Netflix show starting Eliza, Jewish Matchmaking has entered the mainstream lexicon. Welcome to the show, ladies. How are you? Good. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, Aliza, tell us a little bit about you and how you got started in matchmaking and what is your contribution to making matchmaking into mainstream now? So, I got started in matchmaking with a matchmaking website that was matchmakers only, meaning the singles, they can't swipe, they can't set themselves up, they can't view a database. All they could do is sign up. And then as a matchmaker, we could match them up. And there were over 500 Jewish matchmakers on this site. And uh, I had some young kids at home and I was looking to do something to give back to the community, to have some adult interaction and, and some connections. And I got started just uh, just like that. And it rolled on and on and developed into coaching and mentoring and supporting matchmakers and now really inspiring the world with matchmaking and especially Jewish matchmaking. My, my firm belief is that world peace begins at home. And so if we are here doing our job and we are building homes, we are bringing peace to the world. We are doing the greatest good that anybody could ever do. I love it. I love it. Speaking of greater good, Michal, how did you get started in this business? <laughs> Great question. Um, I happened to be sitting on my couch one night looking for a new career and this magically popped up in a search when someone was sitting on the couch with me and she was like, this is you, this is your destiny. And so it was a kismet moment. Danielle, what about you? How did you get started in the world of love? <laughs> Mine started with a master's thesis. I got my master's in Jewish studies and I studied trends in Jewish dating throughout history and up until now. Um, and it was a, you know, an interesting social experiment that I did with some surveys and things that just kept going and going and grew into a position as a matchmaker at a nonprofit here in Philadelphia. Nice, nice. Now, you guys are three Yentas. How do you guys differ from each other, like with your philosophies or how you match people? Is there a big difference between among the three of you? We start with the differences or the similarities. <laughs> Both. Let's talk about differences and similar, sim, similarity. The hard stuff first. Mm -hmm. um, the differences are, well, I think Aliza is like an expert coach for sure. She knows how to get people to work through their problems in a beautiful way or see where they can like get unstuck, right? That's where she really shines. And also- Danielle, 
what I call soulmate clarity, which is like at the end of the process, is this my person? Yes or no? And people are like, I don't know. I don't know. That's really my specialty at the very end of the process as well. Of course, matching, it's got to start out, you know, at some point, but I love to dig in heart and soul to, uh, to helping people gain clarity in the, in their, in their decision. Yeah. Yeah. Danielle, what do you think? Um, so I come at things from a really a community engagement standpoint. I use a lot of events and get togethers and connecting people for the purposes of friendship and networking and dating uh, to, to get people to find the ones that they love. Nice, nice. Why do you and then I do more and then I do more of the matchmaking that you do also, May, where I concierge a service for for one person. Yeah, I love But then it. I also blend some community stuff because that's just a part of being Jewish. <laughs> Would you say that being Jewish actually makes you more, like makes you a better matchmaker because you've been around the whole Yenta philosophy, the whole matchmaking and families and friends, like you've been around it your whole life. So is that kind of just natural for you? Connecting people is something deeply Jewish. It's it's in our bones and in our history for sure. Um, and the the concept of being like a little bit pushy is also kind of inherent. So I think it's it's more okay in in you know in a Jewish community to say like, well, what about this person? What about that person? What are your needs? What do you want? How can I help you? Than it might be in other cultures. Would you say you're a pushy uh, matchmaker, Danielle, or no? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I happen to not be very pushy, I think, but I do like to create uh, environments where people can, where people can get outside their comfort zone to possibly meet someone. I, I'm a little bit encouraging to try new things and, and do stuff that people wouldn't usually do. You know, if there I was like, there was like continuum of pushiness, I feel like Danielle, you're on the lower end of <laughs> pushy and then Aliza. And then Aliza, maybe you're, you and I are on the higher end. <laughs> I'm a little scale. bit of a negotiator. I like to talk it out and I'm not going to twist anybody's arm. I'm just going to sweetly tell them why this is really a good suggestion and why they should consider it. And that usually, uh, that usually works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a group of friends, I think um, a group of us, uh, six girls and one girl in the group is Jewish and she's always you know, maybe a little pushy, but I find she's the most fun. You know, she's the most fascinating, most honest, the most uh, caring. So I, I love I love Jewish friends and friendships. And I think I partly am Jewish inside because I tend to be a little bit pushy too sometimes in a friendly way, like in a encouraging selling kind of way. Um, but yeah, I, I, I could see the Jewish uh, cultures and the Asian cultures are very similar, right? I mean, mm. a lot of the um, Asian singles that I work with want the same thing as my Jewish singles, for example. Education mm. is so important. Uh, family is so important. Being around family, having family celebrations and traditions, all those things. Um, would you say that Jewish traditions are similar to a lot of different ethnic groups and which ones would you say they are similar to? I find that um, faith-based matchmaking is very similar. So um, when I talk to other matchmakers that aren't just from a different background, but there is a basis within their religion to whatever degree, even if it's a minor degree, there's an acknowledgement of something when there's a higher power involved. It's almost like we all speak the same language. So Christians and Hindus and Muslims, and I've worked with many different types of clients for coaching in terms of matchmaking my databases strictly with the Jewish community. But in terms of coaching, I really could work with anybody and people that are faith-based. We, like when we get on the call, it's it's like it's like the same thing. That's why I watched Indian matchmaking, obviously, before I got involved with Jewish matchmaking. I was like, oh my gosh, it's like the same thing. Except if it were Jewish, it would just be like us. But now we're learning about their culture. This is so cool. And I imagine if they made Christian matchmaking or Muslim matchmaking, there would be that same feeling like, wow, yeah, we have a lot of similar traditions and a lot of similar things that we do in the process. And I think it's simply because um, of a, of a faith-based religion. We just, we just have a lot of overlap. I think there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Uh, Danielle, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, I, there's something about um, having faith be a factor in dating that definitely creates a different environment. You know, people have all kinds of things on their deal breaker list and on their on what they're looking for in a partner. And when there's any element of, of culture or faith or background that's part of that, the conversation is different. A lot of times it goes a little more easily to values and, and character traits and things like that um, than perhaps it would in a different, in, in a more secular society. Yeah. Now, how important are looks to your clients, Michal? Like when you work with a guy and work with a girl, is looks like one of the top three things or top five things that people are looking for usually or not really because they're more looking at the different values and things instead of just something superficial? Well, I mean, I can't speak for everyone and I don't exclusively you know, only work with Jewish people, um, but looks and attraction are really important in matchmaking. And so when you are doing a higher end service, it's super important to ask people who they've been attracted to in the past. I know, Danielle, you like to ask about celebrity crushes. I like to know who they were, are attracted to and who has been attracted to them at the same time. And if there's a gap. Uh, which there often is a gap, of course. I mean, it's hard to go with uh, celebrity crushes because I feel like there are a lot of celebrity crushes that people have, but is that realistic? Like, are they falling in love with the characters that they play or are we just going by looks or do you know what I mean? That's a really tough uh, gauge, I would think. Yeah, sometimes it's just to get a gut check, right, about what they're looking for. But often I like to ask about celebrity crush both in terms of like a looks crush and a personality crush or like a vibe crush, right? Like if there's a, if there's a couple on a TV show, like um, um, Marshall and Lily on How I Met Your Mother or something like that, if that's really appealing to somebody, their dynamic, that's interesting to know because it tells you a little bit more about what the person's looking for in a, in a relationship. Now, who is your celebrity crush, Danielle? Ooh, who is mine? Um, I, my generic one that everybody agrees with all the time is Jake Gyllenhaal. He's, oh. he's brought up a lot. He comes up. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mahal, do you, have a celebrity celebrity do you have a celebrity crush, Mahal? I should have a celebrity crush. I mean, when I was a kid, I liked Kurt Cobain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Elisa, do you have one, a celebrity crush? I don't even have a TV. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, you're on TV. You're on TV. I know. You don't have it's a, a running joke. I'm like, I don't have a TV. I'm just on one. <laughs> and I don't really know famous people. I just am one. I, it's not my thing. <laughs> I'm like, not, I, I'm not up with the times. I'm like okay. a little, you know, like you'd, you'd have to go back like a decade or two for me to like recognize names. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I was thinking about attraction. I was thinking about attraction and something about that's really interesting about Jewish matchmaking because Judaism isn't just a religion, it's an ethnicity. And something that we find a lot when we're talking to people in Jewish matchmaking is like how they will um, be attracted to Jews that are from a different ethnicity or region. Like I mean, for sure, like when I meet an Israeli guy in Philadelphia, I know a Philadelphia girl is going to like love that, you know, because they're interested in like, you know, the accent and some of the like manliness that comes, you know, along with being an Israeli guy, stereotypically. Um, or like we saw on the show, um, you know, Eliza talking about Sephardic and Ashkenazi matches and you did the South African match. Yeah, a lot, a lot of different good matches from just all different places. You just know, never know where a good match is going to come from. Yeah, that's really true. Especially just being in this industry for almost 15 years. Like you just wish you could predict things and you make the best match you can. But sometimes you're like, okay, let me, let me just see if this match would work. Let's see how it falls. And then it strikes. So sometimes it is unpredictable. So I know you guys have uh, the Yentas as your um, podcast. Is that correct? That's the name of the podcast? The Yentas. Okay, the Yentas. What is the role of a Yenta in the community? Like we hear about the word Yenta being thrown around a lot. Like how does that play in the community? So back in the day, the Yenta really was 
the matchmaker, but it was a, more of like a negative term, like the gossip and the busybody of the town. And we are totally into reclaiming the term Yenta and having it for the greatest good, which is that we bring people together, that we Yenta, as we joke about it, like we schmooze, we talk to people about people for the greatest good of bringing couples together and building homes and families. Um, but the term itself actually has a pretty negative stereotype. And uh, we did this on purpose to kind of like shake up the world and go, nope, that's not what it is. We're not just a gossipy group, not a gossipy group at all. We're here for the greatest good. We're bringing people together and we get to know lots of people and we network. And like we said, we only believe in collabor collaboration. We don't believe in competition. And you're taking three people, you know, somebody uh, with a business, somebody who just started a business, somebody in a nonprofit, and we all come together and we work together we collaborate on clients it's probably the least yenta thing that we could do <laughs> in terms of the old terminology do you know one of the best i'm oh, sorry go ahead oh i was gonna say it's do you know any uh yentas before you started matchmaking and thought you know what i could do what they do like i'll put a positive spin to it like were there yentas in your life that try to set you up Oh, I mean, there's always yentas. There's like parents and friends and coworkers. There's always like a yenta, but there's nobody in my mind that's like, oh, they were doing this and this was their passion and their dream. And I mean, as a little person, I never, a little girl, I never thought like, oh, one day I grew up, I'm going to be a yenta. It was like, no, one day I'm going to be a matchmaker. Nope, also not a career choice. <laughs> it's really not something that people have an awareness of. I think that there's a lot of modern day awareness now about matchmakers, which I think is really fantastic. So you guys are like the modern day yentas, right? Like taking a potentially negative connotation word and putting a positive bright spin to it, especially the way you guys appear and you're all smiling and the way you dress, it's colorful. Like it's a very positive thing, right? The yentas. Yeah. It is, but I think like a part of our podcast and a part of our discussion and all of our work is that like in being a Yenta and modernizing it, you know, we're working in a field with tools we've never had before. And on one of our podcasts, we talked about the concept of Lashon or, you know, sort of gossiping, talking about others. And what you will find about the matchmaking industry, about Yentas, whether they're religious or not, um, is that our our role is to be pushy, to talk about people, to help create connections and love. And you have to be really careful because we don't have this like set number of ethics, but there are concepts in, in Judaism that, that can guide us and, and help us. So like Aliza, you do trainings for, you know, tons of matchmakers that incorporates ideas like that. What is the biggest challenge about your jobs today that you see happening, Danielle? Like what is something that you find the most challenging, whether it's in your city or just in your field? A few ways that could go. I think, I think that people within them have the push, have a push and a pull that's hard to reckon with. I think a lot of people really want to find someone and are serious about it and are interested in it. And then they are hesitant or, or it's hard to do the hard work that it takes to do that, whether that means putting yourself out there at an event or matchmaker or getting through some of your hurdles with a coach like Aliza. Uh, like the, the part of getting to the point where you find someone is difficult and takes work and is and for some people have described it to me as a full-time job. And so I think that there's a disconnect between how much people really do want to start their lives and find someone um, and move on to the next stage of their lives and the difficult way that it the, the difficult path to getting there. How many hours a week should someone focus on trying to better their love lives? Like, is it six hours a week, you know, go out on two dates? Is it six hours on the app trying to find someone great? Like, what do you suggest someone, how many hours should they put in every week to try to get to their end goal? I, I think that that's a very personal decision and it depends how much they can handle. And some people have a very low threshold, you know, one day a week and they're just done. And other people are like, let's go out on three or four. And we're going, whoa, let's hold back a little bit too much. Um, I think that people need to make an effort. 
I think they should make an effort a minimum once a week if they're in a good headspace to do something, whether it's a date or dating online or working with somebody professionally or just learning about relationships and communication and love. It doesn't actually have to be a date. It just has to be something in that direction. And I think that once they do those things, the, the consistent effort is what will yield the results over time as they're they're putting their efforts in. Hopefully it comes sooner rather than later. But I, I would caution people from dating too much. It burns them out and then they have to go on a dating break and that takes up even more time. Hmm. So and when, they, we, when they go on a dating break, how long should they take a pause? In terms of like a dating, I'm going to call it a dating detox if somebody needs a break. Um, I have a whole program for it, actually, because it, it's such a thing. Uh, anywhere from usually, I'm going to say 30 days to six months plus. Um, if somebody came out of something hard and they're really broken, they really need to get a lot of support. Um, other people, they're like, no, I really just like, I want a little bit of time to reflect. I want a bit, a bit of time to pause and I want a bit of time to redirect. And then they jump right back in. And it could be as soon as I'm saying 30 days, there's people that push the limits and they try to do it sooner. But if you do it too soon, you, you don't usually heal enough. It just depends on how deep the wounds are. Yeah. Uh, were you going to add something, Danielle? Sorry, did I interrupt you? Not at all. Um, I was thinking about uh, channeling Michal here. Michal talks a lot about like manifesting, like inviting into your world the things that you actually want. And I think in some ways, when someone makes that decision to work with a matchmaker and make that literal investment, but investment in time and energy and money, they in some ways are putting out into the world, like I'm ready for this. And so I think to me, to Lisa's point, you know, they get past the point where they need the detox, they need the break, and they're really ready. And that's when they come to a math maker, and they're ready for what Michal also calls transformation for something much bigger than just finding a person for doing some inner work that it takes to get there. So it, in some ways, mm -hmm. working with a matchmaker is like that its own uh, proof of, of that being ready for that. Yeah, yeah. Now, you guys are all very, very similar in some ways. As I'm talking to you, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before, or I've watched one of your videos and heard you spoke and things like that. Now, what, how did you guys come together? Like, how did you meet each other, actually? We were matched. We were <laughs> matched by Danielle. <laughs> oh, Danielle, you're the one that brought them together? I was the matchmaker for Aliza and Michal. Yes, very proud. One of my best matches ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you know Aliza? So um, Aliza actually started her business uh, in uh, under the umbrella of the same nonprofit that I now work for as a matchmaker. And so we have lots of different ways of connecting the Jewish community. And one of those is a network for entrepreneurs. And, and so Aliza was in that program. And actually, I was also in it earlier. Michal actually was in it later. So we're all connected in that way, too, as fellows. Um, but having met Aliza through that, when Michal reached out to me and she was becoming a matchmaker in Philadelphia, I said, these two have to meet. They have so much in common and so much that's different that they must become friends. And then the three of us became a trifecta. And I want to also add, Danielle, that after I graduated and I completed my course and I started to create a training program for matchmakers and for coaches, Danielle was like, oh, I want to do that and I want to bring it back to the nonprofit, which wasn't focused on matchmaking. It was focused on entrepreneurial ventures and community ventures, but not through a matchmaking lens. And she goes, this is good. We should do matchmaking. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm making a course for you. And I literally designed a course for her to take. Uh, and then she brought it back so much so that it's now a full-time or more than full-time position within the nonprofit. And they are bringing matchmaking in there significantly. And it's been fantastic for Philadelphia. Yes. Awesome. That's awesome. So, Aliza, do you train other matchmakers to become Jewish matchmakers? That's what you do? I do. Matchmakers and coaches who are interested in either starting their own business, working for a company or a nonprofit, or just doing it as um, we call it a chesed, which means a kindness and uh, a give back service to the community. It doesn't matter how somebody wants to do it. It just matters that they have the desire to do it and I can help train them. I've trained over 350 people. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Okay. Now, how has the Netflix show influenced Jewish matchmaking as a whole? What have you seen based on when you first started filming the show until now? Like what, what are some things that 
gave you some aha moments or concerns or anything that you could think of? I think that matchmaking was traditionally thought of as a religious thing, that if you're religious, you do matchmaking or you get fixed up and and married, you know, under the chuppah immediately without ever seeing somebody. But what the world came to see was that matchmaking is something that everybody is doing. It's something that the entire modern world has embraced. You don't need to be religious. People that are secular, uh, that just don't have very much involvement with their Jewish life, they're also doing matchmaking. And I think that that was like a big wow for the world. And people didn't, they're like, oh, I didn't think that there was anything for people like me, right? Like, oh, I'm not religious. So there's, there's no matchmaker for me. And there actually are a lot of modern matchmakers in the world. And I think that was a big aha moment for people. I see. I see. Danielle, do you have any aha moments from the show recognizing what, what has come out of the show until now and how that has affected your business? Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is, is related to what Aliza just said, which is that people came out of the woodwork who before may have had some view on what it meant to come to a matchmaker, whether they thought it meant that you were like totally desperate or whether it meant that you had to be super religious. And now I've had people come to me, you know, years after having met them and them not being very interested in matchmaking or anything and, and them saying, I think I'm ready for this or I think I'm interested in this. this. This must be for me or I'm willing to take this leap because they saw so many positive examples of how it looked on the show and so many different kinds of people who were able to access it. So I've been just amazed at how much it's opened people's mind to, to seeing themselves in, in that role as a, as a person to be match made. Yeah, yeah. Mahal, any thoughts and comments? I was just going to say that like what is fascinating about matchmaking is how the sausage is made. And I also didn't like know as much about like how a TV show is made and being Aliza's friend and watching her go through it and hearing about the characters and, you know, when she was searching for matches and then like sitting on my couch and watching the dates happen But you don't know everything that, you know, Elisa went through behind the scenes to like find the matches and make it happen and what people to do to get on Netflix. And then just like watching a date happen. I was like, wow, as a matchmaker, like I really like watching the dates. I wish I could watch more of my clients dates. Um, But yeah, in general, I would say that matchmaking is so mysterious. People really don't know. They think we just like pull rabbits out of a hat. And even on the TV show, they don't know how, how much work Elisa had to do and all the places she had to fly to make those things happen. (laughs) And also how integral um, coaching was that it really isn't just about the match, which is what people think when they hear matchmaker. They think it's just about these like magical matches, but it's not. And when I talk to people now, I'm like, you watch the show. Like, you don't just magically get someone married. Dating is ups and downs and trials and tribulations. And what did you think of this? And what faux pas did you do? And like, uh, what was the one with Danny? Like he didn't pour her the wine and like Mm -hmm. all of these things happen and it's all learning. It's all a process. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love watching dating shows. I mean, when The Bachelor first started, Bachelorette and Bachelor first started, it was so interesting how people interacted and how they misinterpret something. And it all comes down to communication too, right? Like that's everyday stuff. Like you're like, wait, why didn't they talk about that? Or why didn't they talk about this? And so, yeah, anyway, um, I have one last question. What is unique to Jewish dating that isn't present in secular dating? I think we kind of touched on that, but uh, you want to talk about that a little bit more in the hall? Um, I mean, partly that people care a lot what their mothers think, their Jewish mother. (laughs) True. A lot more family involved. A lot of grandparents referring people and telling people to Google us. It's really funny that you said that, Michal, because I had one client tell me everything about what they want and what they need. It was a whole hour long session. They were like really pouring their heart out. And at the end, they're like, yep, well, that's what my mother wants for me. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. We're going to have another session. What do you want? And they're like, I don't know. And I was like, right, we're going to talk about that. And all of my notes, like, that's very nice, but I need to know what you want. And they're like, yeah, I haven't figured that out yet. I was just going with what my mother wanted. (laughs) 
And I was like, no, no. So there, there is a lot of family involvement. There's a lot of, in a good way, a lot of support that's there. People really care. Uh, but I do get a lot of messages from well-meaning parents, friends. I've even had people tell me, huh, I get on a call. Hi, how are you doing? Good. How are you? They're like, so what are we doing? And I was like, I don't know. Tell me why you signed up. And they're like, I didn't. It was my mother. <laughs> oh. Do you guys get a lot of parents that call you for matchmaking their son or daughter and to a point where the parents pay for the matchmaking and then yeah, you're we're all nodding vigorously. Okay. So do you, <laughs> do you keep in touch with the parents still and tell them what matches you're sending to your client? Or do you say, okay, I appreciate you contacting me and paying me but I'm only talking to your son or daughter now. Like, how does that work with the dynamics with their membership? It's very, very individualized. Uh, I would say it's more likely to be, thank you for your support and wanting to support your child and finding their one. We're going to work directly with them. But sometimes people say, no, I don't mind if you give them an update or whatever. Personally, I prefer that they give their parents an update, that it doesn't have to come from us. And that way, whatever they want to disclose, they do. And whatever they don't, they don't. But yeah, there is involvement and it does get messy. And the biggest thing is you cannot have a parent that wants their child to get married more than the child wants it for themselves. So I don't mind if a parent wants to participate, help pay, whatever. But if you want it more than your child wants it, we have a problem and you shouldn't pay me. I would rather them wait and let the desire build until the right moment because it's going to be very hard to attract their life partner if they're not really in the moment of desiring it and wanting it. Yeah. Yeah. Michal, you were yes. going to say something? Oh my God, Aliza, what you said is so true. You know, and I think that a part of why parents come to Jewish matchmakers is because they're like, I don't know how to do this myself. Because, you know, just like how it takes, like, you know, a village to raise children, I also think it takes a village to raise sexually healthy, conscious people who know how to date daters, you know? And I think what we find in matchmaking is some people, you know, are can be in their 30s, 40s, never married, never had a boyfriend, girlfriend. I met with a, a woman today who's, you know, never really had a boyfriend that they can have these like lapses, you know, and weren't really, you know, trained or supported um, in how to develop relationships. There's just no class in school. We don't have comprehensive sex education. People watch TV. They think it happens magically. You know, they think it, you know, I think it's like Disney, um, and so parents come to us because of this, of this huge gap, you know, and they're like, I need someone else involved, some other professional. And it's, it's really delicate, like what Aliza mentioned. Um, but actually just to go on to another thing that I was thinking as we were talking about what's the difference between Jewish matchmaking and other matchmaking is that the thing about Jews that needs to be kind of understood is like, there's a lot of beautiful things that bring Jews together and beautiful practices and stuff, but there's also a lot of of trauma that's that's in our history, um, not only to Ashkenazi Jews, also to Sephardic Jews. That's that's a part of our history that has influenced um, the the pressure on people when it comes to to dating, like the the parental involvement and thinking about generations before you and what they had to sacrifice or live through so that you would raise Jewish children. It's something that's really heavy and. And something that really influences and shapes people's dating goals. I have that experience when, when, when someone comes to me who has a really strong connection to their Judaism, whether that means that they, for example, had grandparents who are Holocaust survivors, or perhaps they're Israeli, and so they're really strongly uh, linked to the state of Israel and to Zionism. Whatever that super strong link is, it makes them more likely to find it important to date Jewish so they take that thing that's important to their family and their history, and it translates into their modern need to date Jewish. Um, whereas for people who don't have as, as strong of a connection or maybe didn't grow up with much of it, they, then Judaism maybe becomes like a, a preference or even a neutral when it comes to dating. I would think that it would be more a little bit of like the pride thing, right? You want to raise Jewish kids. You want to find a Jewish partner who values as much as you do, because I can see some Asian men coming to me and they're like, I only want to date 
Asian, you know, he's Chinese, he only wants to date Chinese, like that's very important to keep that, uh, keep that going in his family and not to date outside, like it's almost uh, like a negative thing if he were to marry someone non-Chinese and have kids that are mixed non-Chinese hundred uh, percent. So I, I see that. I mean, it's, it's very, very important to some people. And I guess that's where hiring a matchmaker can really help them fine tune their search and really try to find them someone that meets and checks all those boxes. So, yeah. Do you ever try to convince them to meet people outside of Judaism or no? That's not something that we do. Um, two reasons. One is our database is strictly a Jewish um, database. That's, you know, our entire network. The other thing is that statistically speaking, um, we have seen that interfaith marriages are, um, there's just, there's a lot of numbers that make it a little bit more difficult for them to stay together, raising family, kids, building a life together, parents, you know, as we're talking about parents being involved, there's a lot more complications. Um, and so for me in my business and what we're doing, we put Jewish couples together. I'm also very happy to put non-Jewish couples together, but, but for me, I'm not mixing that in my business, but I think I, I'm speaking just for myself, not for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Danielle, what about your business? How does your business differ than Elisa's? So for me, all that matters, I don't think that I have any say or any uh, stake in the game of who people date or, or why they date them. What's important to me is that they've thought it through, that it's not just something that they're doing as a knee-jerk reaction. I, I like to make sure people have challenged their own assumptions and their thoughts and made sure that the things that they want in dating are truly the things that they want. And after that, I will listen to them and do whatever they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm in an intercultural relationship. My husband is uh, Caucasian, I'm Chinese. And the tough part is my mom can't really talk to him. You know, my mom only speaks Chinese, so he's not really talking to her. He knows maybe three or four Chinese words, but that's not a real conversation with my mom. So I can see it being very challenging, you know, like I'm sure he would love to talk to her about current events and the news and all that stuff, but, but he can't, you know, it's just the huge language barrier. So yeah, it's interesting. Um, what is one thing I should have asked you that I did not ask you in this lovely podcast interview? If you can, is there something I should have asked you that I did not ask you, Aliza? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you use that question, Aliza. I know I do use that question and I love that question. I'm thinking like, you know, I'm, I've answered so many questions recently that like, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, what, I what about your say, world tour? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I could tell you about that. <laughs> uh, my life has changed significantly because I also started now a world tour since the show came out and every two to six weeks, I'm flying out of Israel for approximately two to three weeks. And I am going all over the States, Canada, um, South America, Australia, we have things lined up maybe in Singapore, Hong Kong, we're looking into um, South Africa. So it's literally a world tour, London. Um, and that's going to keep me busy from now until about a year from now. People are a little upset because we've, you know, if I don't know, maybe there's a date in November, but then like nothing until really January, like everything's really booking out. So um mm -hmm. You know, if you're asking, what do you like, do? Oh, what do you do on this world tour? What do you mean when you stop at these cities? What are you doing? So I'm doing something that I created, which is called a live matchmaking show. So I get up and I do. It's almost like a stand-up comedy routine with a little bit about my life and some humor sprinkled in. Judaism, matchmaking, the show. Then we do an interview where there's a lot of questions about what's you know been happening with the show and my business and life. And then we do live matchmaking. We bring random people that I have never met from the audience on stage. I train the audience to be matchmakers. And uh, we, when I say we set them up, I mean, they set the people on stage up. And I tell them we're locking the doors and nobody's leaving until we <laughs> set them up, until we have some ideas for the people on stage. And we banter it out. We ask questions. I teach them how to be a good matchmaker. It is funny. It's full of humor and love and laughter. And we've had 
um, a lot. I mean, obviously mostly Jewish audiences. And then I've had people, they're like, I'm coming and I'm not Jewish and I love your show and they have a great time and everybody learns something. So cool. I'm doing a lot of matchmaking. This. Where can we watch like an episode? Are they online on YouTube or what? No, it's wait, wait, we're putting one out. We're putting one out, Aliza, from the one that we did in Philly. We'll put one okay. on the podcast for sure of one okay. live matchmaking event. Okay. So we have to, yeah, we have to get the recordings. We have recordings from many of the locations, um, but they, they've all been literally live. Oh, so uh, yeah, we'll follow up with that. Nice. Nice. What is something I should have asked you, Mahal? Um, I was just going to say like something exciting that's coming up, which is we're going to be running a speed dating event for one of Aliza's peoples. And that's going to be cool. Um, that's going Thursday. Danielle and I like to curate speed dating events and like invite people. And I know speed dating, you know, people have their thing about it, but it's different because we only like handpick people. So that's going to be fun. That's in person or virtual? That one is going to be virtual. We do in-person ones in Philly, but this is going to be a New York-based one. And how do you pick the people to participate? Um, Danielle and I um, have a way that we categorize people as unicorns, <laughs> basically <laughs> people who are interesting and we like our unicorns. And honestly, we just, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is Aliza's client, so cream of the crop. And so we're going to work our hardest to find someone who... Uh, who matches all the great things about her. Mm -hmm. awesome. awesome. Okay. Very nice. So um, that's all the questions I have for you guys. Thank you so much for being on the show. If you can give the audience who are listening one dating tip that you really feel like, I wish more people would do this, or this has really worked for some of the clients that I've helped. What is one dating tip that each of you can give to the listeners. And I'll start with Elisa. Ooh, I love this. The one thing that I would tell people to do is to pause and listen to their own inner voice. We have as, as great as my mentorship and coaching and Michal and Danielle's support, as great as any of us can be or any family or any coworker, uh, what I really like to hear and I want people to hear is their own inner voice of what's going on. There are things that people think, there are things that they feel, and there's things that are like an instinct, you know, it's kind of like the, your head and your heart and that gut instinct that are um, talking to you all the time and it gets murmured by other people's voices. So I want everybody to tune everybody else out and I want them to tune up their own inner voice so that they can hear the messages that are coming to them so that we can try to make sense of them. Michal, what's your dating mm -hmm. tip? I was just thinking about how people, that was great, Aliza, um, about how people make dating decisions. A lot of times people say no to a lot of things from a place of fear. And I just want to encourage people that like, if you're looking for love, doing it from a place of love and finding reasons to say yes. I love it. I yes. Love it. Yes to going an event. Yes to talking to a matchmaker. Yes to having someone help you with your dating profile. Just like yes to things. And not be afraid to ask for help. I feel like a lot of times we're afraid to ask for help because it shows that we're weak or a sign of weakness, but it really isn't. I feel like people want to help people. At least when people ask me for help, I'm more than gracious with my time. So Danielle, what about you? What is one dating tip you would give to the audience? I'll, I'll add a practical tip on top of Michal's tip because I think it's great. I, I love when people uh, think really hard about the things that they want in dating. And so one tool that I learned actually from the entrepreneurship world is to ask why five times. So for example, if you really are certain that you want to date someone tall, right? Ask yourself about it five times. Say why? Well, because I think tall people are attractive. Well, why? Well, I guess because I've seen tall people be attractive in society. Well, why? Oh, I guess we decided that because of, right? Like keep going through it and figure out like, like based on your own interests and needs, if you are working from a place of assumptions or if things are really actually truly important to you. Um, Cause it makes it easier to say yes to Michal's point. If you have really nailed down what's actually uh, a deal breaker or key and what is besides the point. Yeah, that was good. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, I will put down in the show notes how people can find you guys. And thank you so much 
for your time today and for all your great tips and all your energy and all the fun stuff. And ladies, if you're listening to this, I'm always looking for lovely Asian women to be part of my database. So please go to two Asian matchmakers com fill out a profile with me so i know where to find you and men if you're out there you want to hire a matchmaker there's three lovely women here and if you want to date asian women yentas. three lovely yentas here and if you want to date asian women please contact me at two asian matchmakers.com and thank you ladies for joining me i appreciate it have a great day everybody thank you may bye thank guys you. yeah